Well, let me welcome everybody here this afternoon. It's my great honor and pleasure to be here to share some of the things that I've come to love about the island. It's uh, Hawaiian protocols to share your voice. And when you present yourselves, I found myself in a unique position of working with fourth grade Hawaiian historical studies. Children come from Maui, Kauai, and Oahu to the big island because this is where all the history is. Well, I'm a 40 year career in a tractor trailer coin alone for 40 years. I changed everything when I came here and I found myself working CDL and big bus tours and I got the kids for three days. Now I'm Uncle Jim to a thousand fourth graders. <laughs> and in that time, period of time, I got to work with the Kapuna, the elders, the older people with wisdom and then sharing the things that inspired me from the moment I got here was the Aloha. The Aloha, the spirit of these people is the philosophy, the root of their culture is Aloha. It's a very simple philosophy. It's a direct reflection of your energy. Your energy put out is reflected back if you have an attitude or a chip on your shoulder. Don't expect aloha. It's a directly reflecting your energy. And so when I found inspired, I'm at the library studying everything I could get my hands on. Pre-Captain Cook truly inspired me, working with the children, working with the kapunas. I haven't been here very long, but embracing me because I've embraced them, I found myself unique position of teaching Hawaiians about their own culture. It's a kuleana, responsibility. You gotta make sure you're doing it correctly. My first bus tour, I had fourth grade students, 53 students, and here Uncle Jim's talking story, and I butchered the name of the queen. Oh my gosh, you know, it's like, it's pretty important to share to the best of my ability. They gently corrected me, and I understand how important it is. So I don't use misspoken Hawaiian. If I do use words, you're pretty sure that you can use the ones I'm not making it up as I go. Teaching Hawaiians about their own culture is kuleana ikapono, to be righteous in your responsibility. And Kumu Peter from Lanikai gave me this responsibility to share this culture to the best of my ability, and I do it that way every day. I've been here seven years, but as a gleamer of knowledge, I've been able to put things together. Working with the fourth grade students, that they perform protocols. Everywhere they go, they go to the, the Heiau, the sacred temple, and they go to visit the statue, they go to the museum. They always present themselves with the Ole, the chant, the Aomai. It's one of the first things I learned with this culture, working with these kids, they're so respectful, I never see anything like it in my life. These aunties and uncles for anyone who's older and brother, sister for same age, niece, nephew, cousin for younger, because we are all part of the same family. The belief system's that strong. The land and the people are one. There's no separation of these things within this culture. So I'd like to start this with the AOMI chant as we get going with the, with the performance today. And I'm gonna call it out for, if you don't know it, to repeat with me in the uh, Aku Mau Mau. And then I'll do the chant, or if you know it, you can join along. So repeat, please. Aku Mau Mau. Aku Mau Mau. Aku Mau Mau Pa. Aku Mau Mau Pa. E o mai, e o mai ka, iki mai luna mai e, ona me apu na no au e me le e o mai, e o mai, e o mai, e o mai ka, iki mai luna mai e. On a me a puna no awe me le e o mai e o mai e o mai e o mai ka iki mai luna mai e on a me a puna no awe me le e. Thank you. The chant has one of these layers of meaning, the count of the meaning of the story, and it's all done in meanings with the mo'olelo, the story, the mele, the song, the pa'o, the prayer, the oli, the chant. This is the way they taught their children. And so through the stories, the legends of this culture are perpetuated from generation to generation with slight variations because each storyteller makes it his own. But the gist of the stories all stay the same, but the count of the meaning of the story is reflected in that chant. It's done in three different octaves, referencing the different layers of meaning within the stories.
the first, the surface, the base octave. Why would it be telling this story? It has a meaning, a reason for telling the story. Underlying that, a deeper meaning, a higher octave, why would they be teaching this story to their children? There's a reason for it. And underlying that, the highest octave, why in life are we having these experiences that become our own stories? Grant us the wisdom of the experience, O great spirit above, and our ancestors, so we don't have to relive the experience over and over again. A pao oli, a prayer chant, asking that from the great spirit and our ancestors for the meaning of the story. So it's a fitting chant in the beginning of a ceremonies, in the beginning of meetings, or whenever there's a lesson to be learned, the Ao my chant is told. Thank you, it's an honor to be able to share it with you. The stories of the Pele and what's going on right now at the volcanic eruptions are so dramatic and people are being destroyed and the destroyer before Pele is told in stories and chants of Pele's arrival to the island called the Holomai Pele, the tale of two sisters, Hi'iaka and Pele, are two of the ohana of Pele. Well, Pele has many ohana, the family of Pele, the globe above, the rumble under the ground, all aspects of the volcano are personified as the demigods. Never were the demigods sacrificed to worship to, but always part of the natural world they had to explain to their children life on the side of an active volcano. But within the story of Hi'iaka and Pele are many different layers of meaning. Layers of meaning, and I've heard the story so many times, and in my first original studies at the library, I found myself so intrigued, I couldn't get my hands out of the library books and the, the pre-Captain Cook history that truly intrigued me. I found a series of CDs and tapes and chanting. Well, I picked up this chanting tape and I recorded it all, and I had to chant of the whole of my Pele. I didn't know what, really what it was, but I knew I enjoyed the chants. Then I got to start to work with the kids and bringing together the connection between the chant and the story, and it's become a saga. I call it a mini operetta. The story is two and a half minutes of fast, furious chanting, the whole of my Pele, and it actually takes about 10 minutes to tell the story. I'm told I'm doing it correctly. I don't have a wine language yet in my repertoire, but I'm really you know, excited about the culture. And in order to get deeper into the, 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 the the stories of the prophecies of the kahunas and the pre-Captain Cook, you have to understand Hawaiian language. So you kids that have it are blessed because this is something I'm really looking forward to maybe incorporating in my life. To better understand it, I have to know the language because through that language is the true meaning. It's a beautiful language with just a few letters, so it's the inflection and the tone in that language that really gives it its whole meaning. Before Pele arrived to the island, there was a demigod here. And this demigod was known as the destroyer. Ailaau. Ailaau was the destroyer. The burner of the forest and the whole Punas district and the whole east side of the island was destroyed, according to the geologists in the 15th century, an eruption that lasted over 60 years built all the land that or Orchid Land is on, Paradise Park, Ainaloa, Leilani Estates, the whole east district of the island formed in a 60-year eruption that was called Ailaau. Ailaau eruption named after this demigod. He was supposed to be the destroyer and he was the destroyer. He burned and destroyed, but the life regenerates after that, so he was also the creator of new life. But the, the stories of Pele chasing out Ailalao of the main crater. But he wasn't dwelling in the main crater. There's so many different ways I've heard the story and I've got to make it my own. So I've kind of woven it together as we've all heard of uh, Kamapu'a'a. Kama -ah. He's the pig god. Well, the eight-eyed pig god that limped up at crater Hale Ma'o Ma'o before Pele arrived and the stories and the transitions of the demigods. So there was a transition in demigods and with the the Kumalipo, the Hawaiian creation story, is 2,000 lines, begat, 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 so they never forgot where they came from. It includes a Genesis story, the Genesis, like the Eden stories of Mauna Kea, meet Mother Earth meeting Father Sky and the creation of humanity itself. So the Hawaiian Kumalipo was spoken within each land division, so they never forgot where they came, but these stories of Pele arrival marks an interaction of King Ka'o from Tahiti a mass Tahitian force that grew with great power, bringing in kings, 
because they had no kings, they had no human sacrifice, there was only one God, and these changes in their culture happened about the year 1200, according to the begat, begat, begats marking of the Kum Lipo. So the stories of Pele arrival also mark the transition in the God system from the one God and no human sacrifice to the four gods and the human sacrifice that we've heard about, everybody's heard about it. But it's, it's interesting how the geology and the formation of the islands is told in these stories, as well as the history of the most dramatic eruptions they ever experienced in their life. And so the stories of Pele, she's had many interactions once she's been there, the stories of Ohia, the, the beautiful tree on the way over to the volcano. You might see the bright red flower. And so the stories of the Kamapua'a, making all the pit craters on the Chainer Craters Road. There's so many pit craters you can't even count them, but the battles of Pele and Kamu, Kamupua'a was the great battles that formed all those craters. So the geology and Pele's arrival right here on Hoa'ulai and Kapu'ulehu, the story of the roasted breadfruit, stories of Pele taking offense of something that King Kamehameha had done in 1801. He was said to arrive at the lava flows over here to perform ceremonies of chant and oli, offering fruits and vegetables as gifts and offerings, and leaving personal sacrifice added into the lava flow of hair and fingernails. And that night, the lava stopped flowing. So the airport is built on that lava flow of 1801. 1859 comes from Mauna Loa. We are surrounded with five active volcanoes. Well, four, five, because Haleakala is still an active volcano. Only one dormant, Kohala Mountain. But the stories of Pele are fascinating. So the story of Ohia and Lehua, because they were lost lovers, and uh, Ohia was a handsome Kane warrior, from, lived from Hilo. And so Hilo, well, he was so handsome, he'd walk down the street, the women would swoo, and they would go, <laughs> see that guy? He was really that handsome. But he fell in love with a commoner, Lehua. And this was forbidden. Considered Kapu, the elites were not allowed to associate with the commoners. To have a love relationship, Kapu, strictly forbidden. The two young lovers knew that it was forbidden love, and Ohia would sneak away off to the slopes of the Kilauea, and anticipating his love, Lehua, to join him, he would play the magical musical instrument called the Oho Na'u Ihu, Hawaiian bamboo nose flute. Who played with the breath of the nose, it was said to have the highest mana, because the nose could tell no lie. Therefore, the music from this instrument was said to swoon the heart of any woman that was to hear the music. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's on the side of the mountain playing the Oho Na'u Ihu, but who was to hear the music? They say it was Pele herself. Transfixed by the sound of Ohia's music, she transformed herself into the most beautiful woman and then approached Ohia to meet the maker of the music. And in the conversation that ensued, it became evident that Pele was enamored with Ohia because she was offering herself to Ohia in a love relationship. Well, my friends, Ohia made it plain to Pele, the volcano god is not right, that the music was not for her. The woman was scorned. She looked at Ohia and she says, mm, as handsome as you are, you're forever to be an ugly old tree. <laughs> the magic was done. Ohia is transformed into that dark, scraggly bark, small, tiny, round leaves, spots, pits, bumps all over them. It's not a pretty tree at all. And Lehua, she starts to look for Ohia, wandering through the Puna forest in the Puna district, and starts to call, Ohia, Ohia, nowhere to be found. The locals found Lehua calling. They say, ah, Lehua. Yeah, oh, he, uh, he's been turned into a tree. There's nothing you can do. Pele's magic is just too strong. With these words, Lehua's heart becomes broken. She falls to the ground and starts to weep so sad. The locals see her so sad. Say, ah, Lehua, you're young and beautiful. You've got your whole life ahead of you. You need to go back to Hilo, find yourself another young Kane, and be happy. She's not having none of that, man. She was distraught. She started to cry all the way back to Hilo Village. Wandering through the village, she caught sight of the kahuna, crying out, ah, kahuna, my Pele has changed my oia into a tree. The kahuna looks as ah, there's nothing I can do. Pele's magic is just too strong. With these words, oh, Oh, Lehua's heart is broken. She falls to the ground and now weeping profusely. But between her tears, she cries out words that the kahuna hears. I don't care what he looks like. He'll always be my Ohia to me. 
And when the kahuna hears this, he says, Ah, Lehua, I cannot change him back. But I could take you, my dear, transform you into a beautiful crimson flower, carry you up to the volcano, and I could place you upon these ohia trees. With these words, Lehua's heart began to swell. Now filling with delight, it rose high into her chest as she cries out, Yes, kahuna, yes, do this magic so that ohia and I can be together forever. And this is the day they say that the kahuna took Lehua, transformed her into that beautiful red flower, carried her up to the volcano, and placed her upon the ohia trees, forever uniting the young lovers of ohia and Lehua. But Pele, she heard of the magic. The magic of the kahuna is toward her magic. She got angry, so she erupted out of the volcano in a fiery fury. She stomped the ground and a wave of lava erupted across the land as she tried to kill all of these ohia trees. But it was to no avail. Ohia endemic to the island with natural island adaptations to survive a lava flow. Ohia adapted to grow roots in the tops of the trees and a breathing apparatus on the leaf. So no matter how hard Pele tried, she couldn't kill them all. And as soon as the lava surrounds the tree, the tree falls on top and a little piece of that root starts the whole next Hawaiian forest. And so my friends, they say that if you pick that flower from off the ohia tree, the lehua, then you would be the one reason that the skies would start to cry because certainly the skies would cry at the separation of these two young lovers. Story of ohia, stories of lava flows too. The whole east side of the island was destroyed. And the regenerator of life in the Polynesian demigods is Hi'iaka, the baby sister of Pele. She wasn't even born when Pele was arrived here. Said to be about the year 1200 from Marquesas Isles, the interaction of Pele with her Ohana, the gathering of the family and giving Pele a, a magic staff by the uncle of Pele. As she made her departure from the Haitian Marquesas Isles, she was said to be guided in the way, guided by Mano, the shark demigod. Amakua, spirit guide, like Native Americans have spirit guides, the Hawaiians do too. The Pao, the Pueo, and the Io, and the, the sharks. Well, the Hawaiians swim with the sharks. It's pretty incredible. It's like everybody else is afraid, but Mano, he led Pele's journey to the north first. But this is the story of Hi'iaka and Pele. And to properly do this, I got challenged by the uncle, the Kumu, sitting behind me, correcting all my misspoken Hawaiian. And I did the story of playing the chant off my recorded radio, off my phone. And then I got into the story and I wove it all together. And he says, Uncle Jim, that was great. But next time I see you, I want to hear you do the chant. My friends, that was about three years ago. About a year ago, I started to put it together. So the chanting of the whole of my Pele, two and a half minutes of the fast furious chanting. It's the most prominent chant on the islands done in luau's, but you don't usually get the story. So I'm going to start this next segment with the chant of the whole of my Pele. Okay. Go something like this. I hold my Pele, my Kiliki, Eli Eli, Eli Eli, Kau my Pele, hold my Pele, my. Kahikina kaukabai mo okini o e hua oku mule hoku pele ma i keki ono i keki a pele ma e kahua ho 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 we eli eli kau mai pele holo mai pele mai kahikina kaukabai mo okini o e hua oku mule. Hoku pele ma i keki, ono i keki, a pele ma e kahua. Ho ho ho, i eli eli kau mai e pele. Nai 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 pele ma i lai la e ahua nai. A pele ma a kalai, a lele i e huni ki alu ka alu ka le hua no. Moku lele a kahui la, a pele ma eli eli kau mai e pele. Nai 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 pele ma i lai la e ahua nai. A pele ma a kalai a lele i e huni ki alu ka alu. Kalehua no, 
Kali kali kole kolo ko kawa papa ho hai hi hai na wake eli eli kau mai pele e ku na na le ka pule na ai mo na 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 papa no na wa hi e la no kile we a ha pele ma pele ma kili ki mai kali kali kole kolo ko kawa papa ho hai hi hai na wake eli eli kau mai pele eli eli kau mai pele i ai Ia, 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 It's so much meaning, and it goes something like this. Marquesas Isles, Pele's family arrived to the northernmost island first. He had the magic staff given by the uncle, the uncle of Pele. He, she puts the staff into the ground at Niihau, and a giant crater formed, but there it immediately filled with water. It wasn't a good hot place for her and her ohana. She had to move up the chain of islands, searching for that perfect hot ground. So next island she approaches was Kauai not finding any good hot ground there, but she did find a really hot guy, Loi Hao. <laughs> Loi Hao is an elite warrior on the island of Kauai and this flourishing relationship was said to last for some time. But alas, Pele had to say farewell to her lover, Loi Hao. She had to continue her journey up the chain of islands searching for that perfect hot ground. So bidding him a fond farewell, she moved up the chain and decks to Oahu. Not finding the good ground she needed on Oahu, she tried some of the smaller islands, Molokai, Lanai, Koholawe. None of those were hot. So then she tried Maui Island, and Maui was found to be hot. Still an active volcano, last erupted 1900, just a short time when you're talking geology. Totally heat signatured and active. But it wasn't the perfect ground she was looking for. So she moved up the chain of islands next. She arrived here on the big island, landed over here in Hilo and started to climb the slopes of the Kilauea. But meanwhile, up there at the crater, Hale Ma'u Ma'u. Hale means the home. Ma'u Ma'u was the eight-eyed pig demigod that lived there before Pele. He sees in a vision of Pele's arrival and in his vision he sees of her power and he fears for his position as Pele approaches he flees. Pele gets psyched to the Ma'u Ma'u. The chase is on and across the Ka'u Desert. As Pele hot in the heels of the Ma'u Ma'u, he was known to be a changeling. He transformed himself into the Ma'u Fern. Pele brushed one of that fronds on that fern, and there's one red frond on the Ma'u Fern touched by Pele here in the story. And that's only one red frond. Well, he sees a break in the action. He transforms back into the eight-eyed pig demigod. And now he's got a bright red streak running down the middle of his back where Pele's touched him. And Pele gets sight of him again. So the chase is on again. And Pele running across the Ka'u Desert, he runs to the south side of the island, South Point. He approaches the cliffs at South Point and Pele hot on his heels. He jumps off the cliff, transforms one last time, and now they say he is forever to remain. And you might have heard of him. The huma huma nuka nuku apu a'a, the Hawaiian state fish, swims away and leaves the volcano's crater vacant. <coughs> Pele, she found that to be the perfect place for her and her ohana. She moved right in, set up house, and now the new residence, Hi'iaka, born from that egg, protected during the journey, plays in the Puna forest, known synonymous throughout all of Polynesia, as Hi'iaka's childhood playground and her love for the forest is known throughout. Well, Hi'iaka, she starts to grow and mature. And Pele, well, she's been thinking about that lost love back in Kauai. She calls out to her ohana, oh, my ohana is going back to Kauai to get Louie all for me. Silence. Nobody wants to get between a demigod and a lover. This would be foolish, possibly. But he, Iaka, she's young and naive. She steps up to Pele and says, Ah, Pele, I will go back to Kauai and get Loi out for you if you promise to protect my Puna forest while I'm away. Well, Pele was set to think for a moment. Comes back with her answer to her sister. He, Iaka, you can go, but you have to be back within 40 days. And I'm told the 40-day timeline explicit. A 40-day timeline for He, Iaka to return with Loi Howe? To save her Puna forest, provisions were made ready and a companion goes along with her. They gathered back in the double hull canoe left in Hilo and they set sail for the island of Kauai. But along the way, 
Many things happen. Trials, tribulations, a uh, giant mole, giant lizard creatures in old stories and legends were moles. Some of them were even winged lizard creatures, so they had to be dragon stories of old. In this part, a giant mole erupts out of the ocean. Hiiaka took refuge along the shores of one of the other islands. There, the kapuna, the elders, the older people with wisdom, start to teach Hiiaka that as the baby sister of Pele, she too is a demigod. And she's learning about her own power, her own power to bring life back to what has become dead. She's given magic skirt by the kahuna of the village and with the new knowledge of her own power presence and the, and the magic skirt wrapped around her waist. She's looking good and she makes her way back towards Kauai. Loi, well, <clears throat> she arrives on the island of Kauai and something's wrong. Immediately recognized something's wrong because Loihau's spirit is floating above the island. Something's happened that Loihau is dead and she doesn't know, so she meets with Loihau's sister and she tells the tale of what happened when Pele left. Loihau was left in despair, distraught over the losing of his love, and this left him vulnerable to an attack of two of the giant Mo'o creatures that erupted out of the ocean. They captured Loihau, separated his body from his spirit, and he, Iaka's told he's kept in the cave above the tall cliffs and um, in the uh, 3,000 foot tall cliffs on the island of Kauai. But be careful, Hiiaka, be real careful. Protecting the entrance of the cave is the two giant moos. Well, she knows exactly what she's got to do. First, she's learned protocols to bring life back to what has become dead. So she needs a place, a sacred ceremony, a place, a hut built of the sacred Hawaiian tea leaves with no doors, no windows, just a slip for them to enter. They can be tied tight shut. A special place being built by Loe House sister and the whole island had to follow protocol. No eating, no speaking during the chanting or the magic would not happen. With the protocols given out, she now goes to do battle with the two giant moos. She crosses the island of Kauai, comes upon the 3,000 foot cliffs. Above the cliffs, she sees the cave. Above the cave, she sees the two giant lizard creatures. She starts to ascend, hand over foot, hand over foot, ascending the cliffs of Kauai. Hand over foot, hand over foot, she climbs, but the moles see her coming and they throw debris down on her and they knocks her right back to the ground. She can't get a good foothold. She calls to Pele for some help and out of nowhere a thousand rats scamper into the cave. They grab the or, 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 thousand rats, scamper up the cliff face and Hiiaka now ascends behind the rats, climbing hand over foot. Hand of her foot, the cliffs of Kauai. Hand of her foot, hand of her foot, she's over halfway up. Hand of her foot, and the Mo'o creatures see her coming again, but this time they swoop out off the cliff face, their winged Mo'o creatures, dive bombing Iiaka to knock her off fast. She pulls the magic skirt in a nick of time at the diving creatures, poof, poof, and poofs them into dust. But the dust revolved into itself, reanimating Mo'os have to be killed three times before they're to stay dead. The battle still rages. The now they're fast and furious, dive bombing Hiiaka just even faster than before. She pulls the skirt, poof, poof, poofs them a second time into dust. But this time the dust revolved back into itself and they're ferocious. They're fire flying from their eyes. They're swooping down at breakneck speeds, barely getting the skirt out. She flings, poof, poof, and the third time bluffs them into oblivion. She ascends the rest of the way towards the cave and the darkness falls upon her. Takes a moment for her eyes to adjust and she looks and finds a calabash or coconut that hangs on the wall. There on the floor is Loihau, but he's too heavy for her to carry. She doesn't know what to do. She calls to Pele and again a thousand rats clamper into the cave. They grab the body of Loihau, descending all the way down the 3,000 foot cliffs all the way to the clearing where the hut has been prepared in perfect Hawaiian protocols for the reanimation of Loihau. So much time has gone by. She's worried for a Puna forest. The wall, she knows her timeline is almost over, but there are feelings welling up inside of her directed at Loihau. She knows that Loihau is to be saved for Pele. To save her Puna forest, she has to reanimate him, but these feelings, these stirrings deep within her, she's young and naive, never acted upon. She enters into the hut and they seal the door tight behind. The coconut was opened and the hole in the coconut was placed over the big toe on the right foot and she starts to slap the bottom of Loe House feet. Slapping and chanting and slapping and chanting and Loe House starts to ascend. Slapping and chanting, he jumps towards the knees but she gets distracted, he's so handsome. <laughs> and he jumps right back out of his body. He, 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 focus, he, 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 focus, no mistakes or this magic won't happen. She refocuses again and she starts to slapping and chanting and slapping and chanting and slapping and chanting. He jumps to the knee, slapping and chanting he jumps to the hip, slapping and chanting, he jumps to the heart, slapping and chanting, he jumps to the face, and poof, Loyal was brought back to life. 
They quickly exit the hut. The feelings are welding up stronger and stronger, but no, she has to get Loe Hal back to Pele to save her puna forest. It's a fond farewell with Loe Hal and his sister. They gather back in the double oak canoe. They make their way back towards the big island, but she's worried for the forest. She stops at Oahu, climbs Waikea, the tallest peak. She looks to the east, and the whole east side of the island is ablaze. Pele has now burned her puna forest. A deep seething anger builds within the demigod Pele, or Hi'iaka, the baby sister. The feelings of anger at Pele are strong, but the feelings for love for Loeha are growing strong too. The conflict of feelings were never acted upon, always remaining chase. She gathered them back in the canoe and they headed right back here to Hilo and then started to climb these, the slopes of the Kilauea, right to the home of Pele at the Hale Ma'u Ma'u. That's where Hi'iaka took Loeha and made mad passionate love to him in front of the goddess, Pele, who erupted out of the volcano in a fiery fury, scooping up Loe Hal, killing him again and casting him into the lake of fire. It's always the guys that get into these things. <laughs> Hi'iaka dove into the lake of fire after Loe how her love now descending deeper and deeper. She dug deeper and deeper, deeper he fell and deeper she dug and deeper it went and deeper she dug and the water starts to flow in and the locals see the water pooling up on the volcano. Say stop Hi'iaka stop or you'll put out the fires of Pele. And this is where it all happens is Hi'iaka captures up the Loe how she reanimates him one last time and as the goddess of life brings life back to the destroyed lava flows of Pele. The whole east side of the island regenerated with Ohia and Lehua, the first plant that grows on a solid rock can produce roots 30 feet through solid rock to regenerate adorning Pele's pit is Hi'iaka and that goddess of baby goddess bringer back of life. And so the stories of Pele, I call it a mini operetta, if you enjoyed that one, that was pretty wild. The geologists are confirming that story as being the actual truth of the volcanic eruptions as told in history, as well as the geology of the whole formation of the islands, they were teaching geology in that story, as well as the transition in the demigods and the bringing up of the king system and the, and the four gods and the human sacrifice. The layers of Kauna are deep within that story as Nihihau would have been the oldest island, eight million years old to this island, one million years old, and the travel of Pele from the oldest to the newest showing the geology of the formation of the island chain. The two most dramatic eruptions that ever happened in this culture were marked in that story about, a, well, they say the 15th century for ending in 1470. This eruption was over 60 years long, responsible for the burning of the whole east side of the island that formed ocean or orchid land and, and, and Inaloa and Paradise Park and that lava flows from that century are told in this story. So this is really incredible weaving of the information. The natives would have said, why? Why would Pele do this to us? So the story had the answer for the people. It took Iaka too long to get back here from Kauai with Loihau. That's why she destroyed the Puna Forest, the most dramatic eruption they ever experienced. They would have had to tell their children about it, but without a written language, it was done in a mo'olelo, the stories they're sharing. So the second most dramatic event they ever experienced in their entire being here in a thousand years of Hawaiians was the digging of the pit crater that formed that nine and a half mile crater with the crater inside. Estimates by the geologists as the 1790 eruption when the lava lake went down, 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 where Loe Hout was cast in and Hi'iaka dove into capture. Down, down, down it went. Down, down, down it went. And two weeks ago it went down, down, down just like the stories told. The east side of the island is split open and the people in Puna are getting burned. The lava lake deflated and we've been getting eruptions going 10 to 20,000 feet. The stories in the Polynesians talk about eruptions going 33,000 feet in the air, creating a nine and a half mile pit crater because of the eruption of, of 1490 or 1470 was the final of that 60 year eruption cycle. So this is the geology told in stories on the fascinating way the island erupts as a super volcano and only can become, become explosive if water is included. So when it reached the water table, it exploded. They say that lava was seen over the top of every one of these mountains, ash and debris in the upper stream, and everybody would have known of these two eruptions. So they would have had to tell their children. A 
few of the stories of Pele. I got an armload of stories of Pele because I had to keep entertaining fourth graders for, for three days. So, yeah, <laughs> maybe I'll come back and do some of the other stories of Pele.